The following is a hoop ball presentation. Welcome to the Fantasy NBA Today podcast. Uh, so, what do we talk about, guys? Anything happen over the weekend? Nothing? Okay, have a good day. Nah, I kid, of course. Welcome to the first off-season episode of Fantasy NBA Today. This off-season, I guess I should say. The 2020-2021 COVID shortened sprint of an NBA season is done. I saw a lot of folks, I'll introduce the show in a minute. I saw a lot of folks on Twitter talking about how happy they were that this season was over. I feel like that's not really the way you should be looking at it. I will say, I should have made some very large pre adjustments to the settings in any head to head league that I was in, or I should have basically just mandated that any head-to-head league I was in was going to have these various changes, and I didn't do that, and that's on me. I didn't make the changes in the ones I was running. I didn't ask for changes in the ones I wasn't, and that made head-to-head this year kind of suck. And you guys know I'm a roto guy anyway, but I'm in head-to-head leagues because I think you need to do both to make sure that you kind of stay on top of your business. But this year was tough. If you got caught in one of those whirlwinds, if you happen to have some Celtics on your team when they were all going through their COVID protocols, or if you had a couple of Raptors, and it's funny, it's one of those things where most seasons, my answer to the question of, hey, is there any problem with having two or three guys on the same team on your fantasy roster? Most of the time, the answer is no, because nothing that happens on those teams is correlated in any way. Maybe they all get food poisoning at the same time, but they miss one game and then they're all back the next night. In fact, in most seasons, I actually like the idea of having multiple players on the same team, provided we're not talking about someone that might be tanking. You know, you're talking about a middle to upper tier team, someone that's going to be competing down the stretch. I actually like it because if one player on that team gets hurt, the other guy you already have stands to benefit. Whereas this season was a little bit different. And I bring that up right here at the outset because today is the first day of our season in review portion of the proceedings. Welcome to Fantasy NBA Today, everybody. I am Dan Bespris. It's the off season. I mean, it's it's playoff season, but for fantasy purposes, it's the off season, and we start preparing today. There is no break. I wonder how all of you guys did. I, I'm guessing a lot of you are probably ready to to shut your brains off for a little bit, but stick with me here. And, and just throw your brain into some weird low-performance state. Like, uh, like you're, at, you're, you're on... Autopilot is not the right term for it, because that means that you're not paying any attention at all. You're at, like, your top gear, where you're just sort of rolling. You know, you're taking in the sights as you're cruising through the passing lane. But you're not, you're not on cruise control. You're not on autopilot. You're, you're actually still paying attention to the road here. And the reason is... I want us to just let some of these ideas soak into our brains. We don't have to do ultra-deep, heavy lifting. We don't have to break our backs right now. But this is when we look back at a season in review and slowly work our way through some of the things we did right and some of the things we did wrong. I also want to take some time at some point on today's show or over the course of the week to talk about how we did. How did we do? I've got the old man squad list floating around somewhere in cyberspace. We'll dig that up. We'll go through that. Interesting, quick overview, by the way. The upper tier old man squad guys were dynamite. The lower tier old man squad guys were really not super effective in Roto. But who cares? No one keeps those guys on their rosters anyway. We will, so we'll talk about that at some point over the next week or two. We'll talk about just general lessons, draft day lessons. We also have the end-of-season rank comparison, which is one of my favorite things we do. It takes a couple of weeks because it's a really intense uh, bit of analysis, and we work through some of the numbers on the podcast. It gets a little bit dry at, at times, but what we do for that is really you're figuring out 
when you're in your draft room, and don't worry, we'll sort of circle back around to some of this stuff as we get closer to, to opening day of next year, we're finding out how much a draft room can actually influence you and when you should and shouldn't let it do so. So we were talking a little bit about players on the same team. And I, I was going to go through the whole spiel here at the beginning of, you can follow me on Twitter, at Dan Bespris, but honestly, at this point, there really, I'd be willing to venture the guess that there is not one new person listening to the podcast today. This is probably one of those only days of the year, but who knows, maybe there is one new person out there. And if you are out there, thank you, hello, uh, at Dan Bespris on Twitter, D-A-N-B-E-S-B-R-I-S. We still have all the same stuff going on around here. Uh, we're partnered with our good friends at Manscaped.com. You can use promo code HOOPBALL20 over there to get 20% off and free shipping on your Lawnmower 4.0, the brand new Lawnmower 4.0. You can also sign up for an account at MyBookie.ag with promo code HOOPBALL. Let them know who sent you. Unlocks a bunch of deposit bonuses over there. We'll be cashing in during the playoffs, or you can just follow Brewski these days because he's been going nuts since the All-Star break. And, uh, yeah, so all that good stuff is still the case. And we're still recruiting at Hoop Ball. So that didn't turn off. I know I didn't talk a ton about it last week. I was sort of kind of wrapping things up for the regular season. But this is the ultimate time to hit us up. If you're thinking about jumping over the fence and coming to the analyst side of the business, we are looking for everything. Fantasy analyst. So if you want to do uh, – Full season fantasy writing, if you want to do full season fantasy podcasting, if you want to cover a team in some capacity, DFS, whatever, you, whatever you're thinking over there, we probably have a spot for you. But I should also, as always, mention we're not looking for folks that just want to dabble for an hour or two every once in a while. This is like, do you want to break into the industry kind of thing. So if you do, hit me up on Twitter at Dan Bespers or email teamhoopball at hoop-ball.com. The reason I'm cycling back to our discussion to start the show the reason that I generally like actually having a couple guys on the same team, I don't target it that way necessarily, but I actually, I'd never avoid it, is for the, the reason I mentioned before. If, think of the Lakers as a good example of this. Uh, Anthony Davis goes down, LeBron's going to have to do more if you had both of those guys. And I wouldn't, it's a bad example because those guys were generally overdrafted. But take most teams you're looking at. What about uh, the Bulls here? Late this season, Zach Levine went down. Vooch, who did miss a game or two in there for an injury of his own, but he stepped up and his usage went through the roof. However, one of the things that I definitely wasn't on the lookout for was the idea of a potential outbreak. And it happened. Now, multiple times. Because this year, the fear wasn't that and, and there was, I should probably clarify, there was the fear that there were going to be plenty of injuries this season with the short offseason and all that good stuff. It's why we generally avoided guys like LeBron and Jimmy Butler and anybody that went deep into the bubble, starting with the finals and then kind of working your way backwards for uh, whoever had the shortest offseason of all. The I wasn't super worried about drafting players on that element if you were looking at guys on the same team. But from the COVID standpoint... You really didn't want to. And that was unfortunate. And I don't think I had a ton of guys on the same team on my rosters, just sort of by chance. It didn't work out that way. But I did have guys on the different teams that all happened to cross paths. Remember, I, was in, I think it was in January where they had that sweeping outbreak where the Wizards had it and the Grizz had it, and the Celtics had it, and there was like three, four teams were dropping like flies, and we were really right on the precipice of the NBA probably having to pause the season for a week or two if they lost any more teams at that point. And, you know, I had a league where I was sitting on Jason Tatum, and I think Phoenix had a few games postponed because they were playing against teams that had COVID. I think I had Booker on that team. So if you happen to get caught in one of those tornadoes, if you had two players on the Celtics or two players on the Raptors later when their whole team was out with it, or two on the Heat when their team was out with COVID, your head-to-head -head league could pretty much get obliterated. Like, you probably were going to lose 8-1 to or 7-2 to for two weeks in a row, and then you get these guys back that really weren't playing at full capacity. I don't know how you recover from that. 
the team I had that had Wizards and Celtics never recovered. Really didn't even get all that close. Fell to the bottom of the pack quickly. I made a bunch of whack moves to see if maybe I could punt a few things and climb back into it that way. It didn't work, but I had no choice. The team was dead. And then there was the injury stuff this last year. By the way, before we even get to the injury side of things, and this is kind of lesson one. Today's episode is lesson one. What do we take away from this season from a player absences standpoint? And we may end up talking about this for a couple of days because it's a, it's a pretty big deal this year. It, 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 it was a cloud that hung over the entire season, and I think it's why a lot of people said, man, I'm glad this season's over, even though I disagree with you. This is fun. It should be fun. If it's not fun for you guys, you're either you're not winning enough or you're doing it wrong. Doesn't matter. My hope and my assumption is that by the time next season starts, most likely in October, I think they're going to be gunning for normal start time. I think it would be absolute latest. Well, let's see. The playoffs start in a couple of days. The real playoffs start a couple of days after that. So... You're talking about playoffs that last about two months. Those will end in mid to late July. August, September, October would only be a three-month offseason for those teams at the tail end of things, but that's still a month longer than the teams at the end of the bubble had. Remember, the bubble ended in what? No, I guess it was a little less than three months, a little less than that. So I, I do think there's, I think there's a possibility that next season starts maybe a hair later than that third, fourth week of, week of October. Like, maybe they push it to the first week of November, something like that. Try to speed it up just a little bit. We don't know for sure yet. We don't. Um, but let's let's operate under the assumption that the NBA wants to try to push it back to the normal start time. So, by late October, from what we know right now, and this is, again, I'm, I'm getting into the pandemic stuff a tiny bit on the podcast, but we do, we have to, because now we're just, we're hypothesizing a little bit here on the, the day after the season ended. I don't think that you're going to have to worry about outbreaks the way we saw this year. I think there will still be protocols. I don't think that's going to be gone. Folks that think that, that that might be gone by October, I think perhaps a little bit too optimistic uh, because there are things like breakthrough cases and we still don't know who is and isn't vaccinated on these teams and there's going to be booster shots and things of that nature. So there's still some variables hanging out there. So I I do think there will still be protocols. I don't know if the testing is going to be quite as rigid and regimented as it was this year, but it might be. And they did relax restrictions on the teams as different clubs hit thresholds in vaccinations. Still, they're going to test. They're going to. And there are going to be protocols. And so you're still going to have guys that have to miss a game here and there. Do they shorten the protocols from a week? It's a possibility. I don't know. I don't know. There will be adjustments, I would imagine, just because as time passes and as we learn more about COVID, still, we're going to be learning about it for a long time yet, Presumably, it'll be easier to, to keep this thing at bay. But what I'll say is this. I, I think next year, we can continue to apply what we just talked about, which is you probably don't want to have a bunch of guys on the same team in an era where player absences can be correlated by teammates. That's never been the case before. Player absences were always generally random if you want to make a small exception for when teams had a particularly grueling part of the schedule. You might see a few guys turn ankles or have tweaked hammies around the same time, and it's why the NBA has largely eliminated the four-game and five-night kind of stuff. They found that players were getting hurt when they were playing that tired in that many minutes. Easy enough. Think about the last time you exercised when you were super tired. You probably came out of it with something hurting because you just were too tired to support yourself the right way. So let's assume that 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 type of stuff, like, let's just forget about that for a minute. That's, That's the exception, not the rule. In general, 
throughout the expanse of time that folks have been playing professional sports, or certainly as long as we've had fantasy sports, player absences were not correlated. They weren't. Rest days, maybe. But generally, you'd see a team rest one guy and not the other guy, whoever the other guy is that sees the big boost in usage or the third guy or whatever it is, other than the last day of the season. I know I know, yesterday is fresh in everyone's mind where teams rested everyone to tank their way into playoff matchups and stuff like that. But again, that's the exception. That's one day out of a generally about 175-day season. But I believe, and write this, like, take a second to write this stuff down, because I definitely am. Player absences might be correlated again next year. So on draft day, and don't worry, we'll go through all these names in due time. We've got a nice long offseason to do it. On draft day, if you have Dame, if you get Dame at like the 7th or 8th pick or something like that, you probably don't want to get C.J. McCollum in the fourth round or wherever he's going next year. Another guy who uh, tapered off a little bit after. Remember C.J.'s insane start? Dude was hitting five three-pointers a game. Still ended up with a pretty good year on a per-game basis, at least. He was number 30 per game in 9-cat, but uh, definitely came off of that crazy hot start after the, the fractured foot. But we just don't know. You know, if... if, if I don't know if Dame and CJ are vaccinated. I don't, I don't actually care for today's show's purposes. It doesn't have any bearing on anything. It's a hypothetical example. But if there's an exposure on a team, like what if they have a teammate that actually gets COVID? Whether they are or are not vaccinated. Certainly there's a higher likelihood on one side than the other. But just assume for this hypothetical example, someone gets it. And they're exposed because the uh, things are not as strict next year because of teams hitting different thresholds. Yeah, the protocols will be shorter. The quarantines will be shorter. But you're still talking about a scenario where absences might be correlated. There may be times where you can't avoid it. If Tobias Harris is sitting there at 60 next year and you already have Joel Embiid, who... I don't know that I would recommend you go and get because he's going to miss a third of the season. That's just how things go for him. But let's say you had, let's say Embiid somehow falls way farther than he actually will. You end up with Embiid in the second round and Tobias Harris is there at the end of the fifth round. Okay, fine. Like at that point, you take the risk. You take the risk because you know you're getting a fat win. Might burn you if there's a team wide thing that happens. But at that point, you, you, you take the risk. I'm talking more about if there's someone that's a relatively safe pick. Let's like Kawhi Leonard, Paul George, because you could end up with Kawhi in the first and PG in the second. I don't think I would do it specifically because we still don't know how this games missed stuff is going to correlate next year. And those two guys missed their own their respective number of games anyway. But hopefully, you guys catch my meaning. So. Uh, I think that player absences may remain correlated, not quite as tight this year as it was last season. And it's a much bigger deal for head-to-head than Roto because in Roto, it doesn't matter when guys miss games. And head-to-head, what you don't want is you don't want guys to miss games during your head-to-head playoffs, and you don't want your guys to miss games at the same damn time. Oh, brutal. So brutal. It's actually kind of amazing the damage that that can do which under in a normal season is perfectly random. You get drilled, tough luck. And we've all been there. I've had a roto team that had eight guys out at the same time. Thank the good Lord that wasn't a head-to-head team because that team would have been dead. I would have had to drop four of them. Which four? I don't remember. By the way, just to pause my, my stream of consciousness here, I love off-season podcasts because we're 19 minutes into a show and I'm just yammering. This is just the stuff that goes through my head as I'm analyzing a season gone by. And I hope that you guys find this as, I don't know, meaty. 
this is this is where we get our little tiny edges on the competition. This is where we get them. Which, by the way, brings me to uh, my results from this season. Let's talk a little bit about that. I know I've had uh, folks write in and say, we don't care what your fantasy teams are doing. But then I've had other folks that said, we really do want to know. We're listening to you every day. If, if you're terrible, you're blind leading the blind on this thing. Um, this season for me was very much a mixed bag, as it was, I'm guessing, for a lot of experienced fantasy enthusiasts. And the reason I've talked so much about the injury stuff is that that was so much at the forefront for what I looked back and could do differently this year. I uh, am, was, currently, I am in six Yahoo Cash Leagues. That's turned out to kind of be the magic number for me. Anything less than that, I felt like I probably could have done a little bit more. And, and really, this was probably too much, because they're all daily. I don't have any weekly leagues. It's all, like, you got to be Johnny on the spot on every damn league every day, forever. You can't take your eye off the computer for five seconds. I didn't make it past the semifinals in any of my head-to-head leagues. Why? I can, I can isolate it very quickly. In the one where I made it to the semis and thought I almost for sure was going to end up in the finals, that was a league where I had nine guys hurt in 11 days. What are you going to do? It's a four-weekly move league. I used eight moves dropping injured players, and I had more injured guys that I couldn't drop because I was out of moves. I was just taking zeros, and there was nothing I could do about it because so many guys were hurt, including but not limited to Zach Levine and Trey Young. So I lost my first and my third round pick in that league. It's a, it's a bit of, it's sort of points league E, if you're wondering how I ended up with those two guys on the same team. Yeah, you're right. They were kind of carrying my team. And yeah, things didn't go so great when they both went down. But it really was more about the fact that I couldn't get out from under other zeros. Because I was going to hold on to those guys. There was only one injured slot, but, you know, Trey Young, it seemed like he was going to try to get himself back. And he did get back for, I think, the last game of that week. Um, another head-to-head team missed the playoffs by a half game. And I know exactly what I did wrong in that league. I sat on injured guys who were more like top 70 to top 110 range type of injured dudes for way too long. Guys like Larry Nance Jr., who I love, but I sat on him for a month. And that's a guy that, in a head-to-head league, if he's your only injured player, you can sit on him because there's probably an injured slot. Or even if you have maybe two injured players and one of them is Larry Nance, you could take that one guy getting zeros. But when it was... And I'm going to do my best to try to remember it because, again, with with uh, six cash daily leagues, you sort of uh, you lose track a little bit of which thing was which. But there was a Nance. Uh, I held on to T.J. Warren before they finally announced that he was out for the year. Alec Burks, who got off to that great start and then had the bad ankle sprain. And then it looked like he might have a role but the Knicks traded for Derrick Rose, so that kind of blew that up. That was a guy I sat on for too long. Aaron Gordon, I sat on for way too long. So that was a team, and then uh, Christian Wood was on that team as well. And so when you look at a team like that, what I don't know how many names I just listed, five-ish, five guys that were all out for a month or more around the same time, of the names I just listed, I'm pretty sure that Wood, Warren, Gordon, Nance? Am I getting that right? All overlapped, and then Burks was slightly before some of those guys, so maybe his wasn't quite the same overlap level. But you can't, you just can't take that many zeros, it, it, especially in a shortened season. So it kind of snuck up on me. If I had more time... If there was another week or two, I mean, the season was was about two and a half weeks shorter than a normal NBA campaign. So if the regular season went another two weeks, I probably would have made the playoffs in that one. And had all of those decent injured players. 
But if you could go back and do it all over again, I ask myself, what would you have done differently? Well, I would have gotten rid of Aaron Gordon the second he got hurt because he wasn't that good even when he was playing. I'd have gotten rid of TJ Warren the second they said he had surgery and wouldn't give us a timetable. I probably would have held on to Christian Wood. I think I would have done that one the same. I probably would have gotten rid of Larry Nance Jr., who is so wonderful in Roto and pretty damn good in head-to-head, but built a little differently, and that's a lot of zeros. So you hold on to Wood. Oh, I I ended up stashing. I think I picked up D'Angelo Russell at some point in that league, too, so that was dumb at that point i I think i picked him up because i was like well i got these four guys getting zeros already i'm losing seven to two six to three every week screw it might as well just pick up another guy who's gonna be good later but that was dumb i went the wrong way i leaned into the swerve can't do that can't do that in a shortened season uh can't afford to take that many hefty losses and the amazing part about that one is that none of those injuries were correlated. They were just all a bunch of big injuries from players on different teams that all happened around the same time. That's a lot of bad luck. Think if even two of those either don't happen or if I just abandon ship on, say, Warren and Gordon, probably end up not only making the playoffs, but probably top three. Oops. And the third head-to-head team where I didn't even come close to making the playoffs. That was the one I talked about earlier in the podcast, where I ended up with uh, Boston, Washington, and Phoenix guys that were all out at the same time, and they just happened to be like three of my top four players. And so I went from kind of middle of the pack. My team wasn't that great in that league anyway, but fell right to the bottom, and there was no coming back. It wasn't a great team. That one probably wasn't going that far regardless. But when you get nailed with COVID... And then you're like, all right, well, you know, at least maybe they'll make the games up later. Ah, they're probably going to sit them out. <laughs> they're going to sit out the, re- the some of the makeup games. So you're losing those games anyway, and they're probably making them up during the fantasy playoffs, which I wasn't in in that league. A lot of good that did me. Meanwhile, meanwhile, in my Roto leagues, one of them is a keeper league. Probably don't care that much about that one uh, because... It doesn't really, it's not really contingent on my rank board. I'm very rarely going to get the guys I'm targeting. And when you do, you got to get them way early because players are goofed all over the map. Uh, the other two Roto Leagues I'm in, first place in both and not close. A round butt kicking of some of you listening to the podcast. So tick my, I tip of my cap and then I take the cap all the way off and I hand it out and I wait for you guys to all pay me my winnings. Um... And it's not fair for me because this is like process. You got to go process over results. And the results were good here. And they believe the process was also very good. But it's also sort of, it's creating this this self-fulfilling prophecy of a guy here on a podcast, me, talking about how much he's liked Roto for four years. And then in the season where COVID just smokes one of his head-to-head teams, random injury smokes another, and additional playoff injuries smoke the third the teams that are doing really well of course are the roto ones because yeah those teams also had injuries and also were relatively beat up from time to time and it didn't really matter that much because when everything rolled together the guys played the number of games that i handicapped they would play i took dame paul george and chris paul as my first three picks in one of them And those guys pretty much played the number of games that I expected them to. Dame, 67 out of 72. Paul George, 54 out of 72. That's actually more missed games than I expected out of PG. I thought he'd be be up near 60. Chris Paul, (laughs) I mean, this is crazy, 70 out of 72. I did not expect that. I I thought 64. So he exceeded expectations there. But again, it was not about when the missed games happened. It was just understanding that these guys were going to miss a few games at some point along the way, and Chris Paul didn't really, but you catch my meaning, and then building a team based on the totals you expected to get out of those guys, not really being concerned when they got to them. 
The other one, uh, other Roto League that finished in first, that was Nikola Jokic, DeAndre Ayton, and Chris Paul. Again, I, Chris Paul was my third round pick in basically every league where I could get him. So that <laughs> shouldn't surprise you guys. And of course, Jokic ended up being uh, fantastic. That was fortunate. Um, I probably would have taken Dame, but I believe our own Alan Soroki was right in front of me at that draft and took Dame, and then I got Jokic. Not that Dame didn't turn out to be great also. He was, I think, top five by totals this year, but Jokic was number one, and uh, by totals, it just wasn't even close. Steph was number two, and he was like a full second rounder behind Jokic at number one because there there was a nine-game difference between those two guys. That's crazy to get nine extra games out of the guy that was already the number one dude by averages. And then DeAndre Ayton, who by all accounts had not that great of a year, played in 69 of Phoenix's 72 games and finished at number 18 by totals in one of the great surprises of the season. This is a guy who was really disappointing for about two months. He was pretty good the last three. Uh, Last three months, DeAndre Ayton was number 28 on a per-game basis, just really quietly very good over those three months. And because he was super durable, he actually ended up hitting his ADP. No one thought that was going to happen, myself included. He actually, uh, I think he beat his ADP by like two slots. He was going around 20, and he finished at 18. And then Chris Paul, who we've already talked about, he finished at number five by totals, just uh, annihilating his ADP. And that's that same kind of thing. That team happened to be extremely durable top three. My top three picks in that league missed zero, three, and two of their games. So out of uh, 216 uh, possible games, they played 211. You're going to be top three in your league if you have three decent picks at the top that that miss a grand total of five games between all three of them. And then there was a lot of wheeling and dealing and things of that nature. Uh, and I don't think you guys cared that much about exactly how these drafts turned out. But it is important to note that these teams had injuries as well. Paul George missed a bunch of games in that first one. I had Mitchell Robinson, who missed a bunch of time in the second one. I ended up trading him at, at one point in the middle of the year, so that helped me out quite a bit. Um, Miles Turner. Missed a bunch of time at the end of the season, although I traded him, well, like maybe three weeks before he got hurt, so that was kind of lucky. Clint Capella didn't miss that much time. Colin Sexton didn't miss that much time. Kemba Walker, who I I tell you guys never dropped an injured guy, but he was in the 90s, so screw it. I took him. By the way, the question of did Kemba hit his ADP, the answer is no. He didn't. Number 121 by totals this year. That's why you don't draft injured guys. But he did end up having some uh, pretty decent per-game numbers. He was number 61. So at that point, I knew I had so many durable guys on my team. I thought, well, why the hell not? I'll go Kemba here, and uh, if I can just squeeze half a season out of him, that'd be great. But that's the magic of Roto, is you handicap how many games they're going to miss, but you don't have to handicap exactly what day during the season it's going to happen. I had Lonzo Ball in the other league. He missed a bunch of time, but whatever. I mean, that was how we handicapped it. Durability is a big deal. Durability is a big deal in fantasy, but I don't I don't want to use up that discussion point on today's show because we've talked about it enough times to say, look, durability is the 10th category now. I pretty I I pretty firmly believe that the the reason I won one of those two Roto Leagues as easily as I did is because my top five picks were all very durable this year. We already talked about Jokic, Aiton, and Chris Paul. Damanis Sabonis was uh, the fourth rounder. He missed 10 games, but that was actually still slightly better than league average, so he finished at number 24 by totals. And then Rob Covington was my fifth round pick. By the way, uh, a lot of hoop ball faded Rob Covington this year. That was one where I I bucked the hoop ball trend, and I said, no, I'm still with my guy. And he played 70 out of their 72 games and finished at number 20 by totals. So my top five in that league finished at 1, 
18, 5, 24, and 20. I think that team was in pretty good shape. And then you can take some chances after that. All that to say that in a Roto League, even if you do have players on the same team, if it turns out, like I had Aiton and Chris Paul both on Phoenix, and they they had some games postponed, but they ended up playing them later. And I, I think they played in their makeup games. Maybe maybe they skipped one of them, but I whatever. You know, the correlation factor is not such a big deal the way that those guys, like, think about it from this perspective. Because I, I think as I'm talking about this, some can get lost in the fact that there, it, these off-season podcasts are a little bit more meandering than the regular season ones. Chris Paul, who I just told you about, number five by totals this year playing in 70 out of their 72 games. DeAndre Ayton, number 18 by totals this year, played in 69 out of their 72 games. Those two guys played far more games this season than the average NBA player by a lot. I mean, we, we just talked about with Demonis Sabonis. He was right around league average. Like the, Most people in the NBA missed about 10 games this year, 10 or 11 games was league average for, like, basically the top 150 fantasy players. Missed about 10 games on average. Normal 82-game season, it's much closer to 8. So that was a big deal this year. The durability factor was enormous. And yet, and this is why I really do struggle when folks are like, I got to play head-to-head, I got to do it. It's, it's just not right. your season could have been shaken up or partially ruined when two guys who had some of the most durable seasons in the entire NBA had a pair of games postponed at the same time and pushed back to, I don't know, some week where maybe you were going to win anyway or some week where... They weren't going to play one of the makeup games or push back to a playoff week even? I have to admit, I'm, my full disclosure, I don't remember exactly when Phoenix's games got made up. Whenever they... I, like, you can go through the game log and figure out when they disappeared and then when they reappeared. Uh, I don't think they waited all the way into the fantasy playoffs to, to make up the one or two games that they had shifted early in the season. But does it feel right that these two guys who were healthy, I mean, these guys didn't even have any COVID stuff. Phoenix's stuff was largely because they were playing other teams that had outbreaks, and so they just couldn't play those games. So you're talking about healthy players in a full bad luck situation. They weren't hurt. They weren't sick. They just were happened to play against teams back-to-back, basically, that had COVID outbreaks going on. Does it seem right for the fantasy team that has those guys, like if you had Chris Paul and DeAndre Aiden on the same team the way I did in a head-to-head league, to just lose a week because some other team screwed up their protocols? Hell no! It should be the way it was in the Roto League where I thought, ah, damn it. But then they made him up later. I got my points out of those guys. It went into my big bucket of stuff. And I didn't have to worry about it. Don't get me wrong. I'll still do my damn head-to-head leagues. But this is why, like, those little things that hopefully won't be as big of a deal next season and then maybe not a deal even at all by the season after that. It's a really big reason in head-to-head to think twice before drafting guys on the same team. And also a really good reason to maybe give Roto a look. Because the best team wins. I would like to address one other head-to-head thing on today's first podcast of the offseason. Because it's now I have a bit of a case of oral diarrhea. You're going to listen to this podcast for a long time. You're well aware I say, ah, it'll be a shorter show. And then I isn't. Um, I've had people say to me, Dan, the head-to-head playoffs are like the real playoffs. If your team loses its best player, you will lose your 
playoff matchup. Okay. On the surface, that sounds like a pretty damn reasonable statement. If I was the Atlanta Hawks and I lost Trey Young in a playoff series, I probably wouldn't win that playoff series. As is the case, if I'm a fantasy team and Trey is my best player who I took in the first round and he goes down, I probably won't win that fantasy series. But I would offer you this rebuttal. It's not the real playoffs when we have our playoffs. The reason that I think the head-to-head playoff format in fantasy is nonsense or poppycock or whatever you want to call it is because it happens at the exact time of year when real NBA teams and players are trying to get right for their actual real playoffs. Trey Young's not a great example because he tried to fight back and play as fast as humanly possible. But a lot of guys had... They bumped their knee. They bumped their knee. Or they, you know, hit the side of their head when getting into their car. I, I imagine that happens to NBA players a lot. It's not a problem that I suffer from as an, uh, a well under six footer. But they probably clunk their head trying to duck into an automobile. And they might just sit out a game. In normal seasons, that'd be late March or early April. This year it was a month later than that. How exactly is that? The playoffs? I don't like the head-to-head playoffs because it's a time of year where we in the fantasy community care more than the players on the court. As someone who's been a handicapper or sports better for a very long time, one of the main rules in sports betting is don't bet on a team where you're going to care more about the game than they do. That's something that you sort of take into account generally at the end of regular seasons in any sport. But mostly NBA. Because at the end of a baseball season, rosters expand and bad teams play their uh, super young guys who are like, maybe if I hit 450 right now, I can be on the team on opening day next year. So those teams actually sometimes play better. In the NBA, when they play the guys that didn't deserve playing time during the regular season it's because they're not good. And they're going to get steamrolled by a team who still cares a little bit. So why exactly? Tell me again why exactly I should be thinking, oh, if one of my main guys decides he needs a week to just take a deep breath and have some smoothies, how is that like real playoffs? They have playoff leagues. And this is not me being an ass, this is a real thing. If you want to play playoff fantasy style, just play in a playoff league. You draft a team based on who you think is going to go deepest into the playoffs, basically, and put up the biggest numbers on the way, and then you just don't touch them. That's playoffs. Guys are going to play every day unless they blow out their ACL or Achilles. That's the way it works in the actual playoffs. You don't have to worry about goofball rest days. So give Roto a try, and don't worry, for those of you that are doing head-to-head, we still got strategy for you as well. Day one of the offseason complete, lesson number one, assessing correlated games missed going into 2021-2022, next NBA season. Tomorrow, lesson number two, we will continue our journey. We got a long way to go, friends. Thanks for listening, everybody. Hope you all did wonderful in your leagues. Please do. Tweet at me. Let me know how your leagues went this year. I would love to hear from anybody that thought, damn, this podcast made me better. That would make me feel very good. Not that that's your responsibility, but we all could use a little good news, can't we? I'll retweet that joint. We'll find out everybody on the podcast here that's uh, that's been kicking ass and taking names. I am Dan Baspers. This is Fantasy NBA Today. Hello, off season. Goodbye, regulars. Play-in game coming up here soon. That'll be fun. We'll talk about that when it gets here. Uh, For now, we will wait on health of different players in the play-in tournament. We know LeBron turned his ankle on Sunday, uh, but presumably he'll be in for that one as well. So uh, don't worry. We'll talk about that when we get there. For now, have a lovely Monday, everybody. We'll talk at you tomorrow.
This has been a Hoop Ball presentation.